The recorded history of the Dominican Republic began on December 5, 1492 when the European navigator Christopher Columbus happened upon a large island in the region of the Western Atlantic Ocean that later came to be known as the Caribbean. It was inhabited by the Torno, an Arawakan people, who variously called their island Iti, Borjo, or Quisquea. Columbus promptly claimed the island for the Spanish crown, naming it La Isla Espar plus or minus Ola, later Latinized to Hispaniola. What would become the Dominican Republic was the Spanish Captaincy General of Santo Domingo until 1821 except for a time as a French colony from 1795 to 1809. It was then part of a unified Hispaniola with Haiti from 1821 until 1844. In 1844, Dominican independence was proclaimed and the Republic, which was often known as Santo Domingo until the early 20th century, maintained its independence except for a short Spanish occupation from 1861 to 1865 and occupation by the United States from 1916 to 1924. Pre-Spanish History The tall no people called the island Quisquia and Deity. At the time of Columbus' arrival in 1492, the island's territory consisted of five chiefdoms, Maria Copyright N, Magua, Maguana, Jaragua, and Higa one quarter I. These were all respectively by tribal chiefs Guacanagorics, Guarianex, Canabo, Boechelo, and Caracoa. Spanish colony, first period 1492 a Euro 1795. Equals arrival of the Spanish equals. Christopher Columbus reached the island of Hispaplas or Minas Ola on his first voyage, in December 1492. On Columbus's second voyage in 1493 the colony of La Isabela was built on the northeast shore. Isabela nearly failed because of hunger and disease. In 1496 Santo Domingo was built and became the new capital, and remains the oldest continuously inhabited European city in the Americas. Equals 16th century. Taino decimation and African enslavement equals, hundreds of thousands Tainos living on the island were enslaved to work in gold mines. As a consequence of oppression, forced labor, hunger, disease, and mass killings, by 1535, only 60,000 were still alive. In 1501, the Spanish monarchs, Ferdinand I and Isabella, first granted permission to the colonists of the Caribbean to import African slaves which began arriving to the island in 1503. These African impatees have had the most dominant racial influence, and their culture has an influence second only to that of Europe on the political and cultural character of the modern Dominican Republic. In 1510, the first sizable shipment, consisting of 250 black Ladinos, arrived in Hispaniola from Spain. Eight years later African-born slaves arrived in the West Indies. The colony of La Spar plus or minus Ola was organized as the Royal Audiencia of Santo Domingo in 1511. Sugar cane was introduced to Hispaniola from the Canary Islands, and the first sugar mill in the New World was established in 1516, on Hispaniola. The need for a labor force to meet the growing demands of sugar cane cultivation led to an exponential increase in the importation of slaves over the following two decades. The sugar mill owners soon formed a new colonial elite, and convinced the Spanish king to allow them to elect the members of the real audiencia from their ranks. Poorer colonists subsisted by hunting the herds of wild cattle that roamed throughout the island and selling their hides. The first major slave revolt in the Americas occurred in Santo Domingo during 1522, when slaves led an uprising in the sugar plantation of Admiral Don Diego Cola Cuden, son of Christopher Columbus. Many of these insurgents managed to escape to the mountains where they formed independent maroon communities. While sugarcane dramatically increased Spain's earnings on the island, large numbers of the newly imported slaves fled into the nearly impassable mountain ranges in the island's interior, joining the growing communities of Samara Cubniza Euro literally, wild animals. By the 1530s, Samara Cubden bands had become so numerous that in rural areas the Spaniards could only safely travel outside their plantations in large armed groups. Beginning in the 1520s, the Caribbean Sea was raided by increasingly numerous French pirates. In 1541 Spain authorized the construction of Santo Domingo's fortified wall, and in 1560 decided to restrict sea travel to enormous, 
well-armed convoys. In another move, which would destroy Hispaniola's sugar industry, in 1561 Havana, more strategically located in relation to the Gulf Stream, was selected as the designated stopping point for the merchant flitters, which had a royal monopoly on commerce with the Americas. In 1564, the island's main inland cities Santiago de los Caballeros and Concepa Cube de la Vega were destroyed by an earthquake. In the 1560s English pirates joined the French in regularly raiding Spanish shipping in the Americas. With the conquest of the American mainland, Hispaniola quickly declined. Most Spanish colonists left for the silver mines of Mexico and Peru, while new immigrants from Spain bypassed the island. Agriculture dwindled, new imports of slaves ceased, and white colonists, free blacks, and slaves alike lived in poverty, weakening the racial hierarchy and aiding intermixing, resulting in a population of predominantly mixed Spaniard, African, and tall no descent. Except for the city of Santo Domingo, which managed to maintain some legal exports, Dominican ports were forced to rely on contraband trade, which, along with livestock, became the sole source of livelihood for the island dwellers. In 1586, Sir Francis Drake captured the city of Santo Domingo, collecting a ransom for its return to Spanish rule. In 1595 the Spanish, frustrated by the twenty-year rebellion of their Dutch subjects, closed their home ports to rebel shipping from the Netherlands cutting them off from the critical salt supplies necessary for their herring industry. The Dutch responded by sourcing new salt supplies from Spanish America where colonists were more than happy to trade. So large numbers of Dutch traders pirates joined their English and French brethren in the Spanish main. Equals 17th century, French encroachment equals. In 1605, Spain was infuriated that Spanish settlements on the northern and western coasts of the island were carrying out large-scale and illegal trade with the Dutch, who were at the time fighting a war of independence against Spain in Europe, and the English, a very recent enemy state, and so decided to forcibly resettle their inhabitants closer to the city of Santo Domingo. This action, known as the Devastations de Osorio, proved disastrous. More than half of the resettled colonists died of starvation or disease, over 100,000 cattle were abandoned, and many slaves escaped. Five of the existing 13 settlements on the island were brutally razed by Spanish troops, many of the inhabitants fought, escaped to the jungle, or fled to the safety of passing Dutch ships. The settlements of La Yoguana, and Baija, on the west and north coasts respectively of modern-day Haiti were burned, as were the settlements of the Monte Cristi and Puerto Plata on the north coast and San Juan de la Maguana in the southwestern area of the modern-day Dominican Republic. French and English buccaneers took advantage of Spain's retreat into a corner of Hispaniola to settle the island of Tortuga, off the northwest coast of Hispaniola, in 1629. France established direct control in 1640, reorganizing it into an official colony and expanding to the north coast of Hispaniola itself, whose western end Spain ceded to France in 1697 under the Treaty of Rissac. In 1655, Oliver Cromwell dispatched a fleet, commanded by Admiral Sir William Penn, to conquer Santo Domingo. After meeting heavy resistance, the English retreated, taking the island of Jamaica instead. Equals 18th century, colonial decline and Haitian revolution equals, the House of Bourbon replaced the House of Habsburg in Spain in 1700 and introduced economic reforms that gradually began to revive trade in Santo Domingo. The Crown progressively relaxed the rigid controls and restrictions on commerce between Spain and the colonies and among the colonies. The last flitters sailed in 1737. The monopoly port system was abolished shortly thereafter. By the middle of the century, the population was bolstered by immigration from the Canary Islands, resettling the northern part of the colony and planting tobacco in the Saibao Valley, and importation of slaves was renewed. The population of Santo Domingo grew from about 6,000 in 1737 to approximately 125,000 in 1790. Of this number, about 40,000 were white landowners, about 25,000 were mulatto freedmen, and some 60,000 were slaves. However, it remained poor and neglected, particularly in contrast with its western, French neighbor Saint-Domingue, 
which became the wealthiest colony in the New World and had half a million inhabitants. As restrictions on colonial trade were relaxed, the colonial elites of St. Domingue offered the principal market for Santo Domingo's exports of beef, hides, mahogany, and tobacco. With the outbreak of the Haitian Revolution in 1791, the rich urban families linked to the colonial bureaucracy fled the island, while most of the rural Hateros remained, even though they lost their principal market. Spain saw in the unrest an opportunity to seize all, or part, of the western third of the island in an alliance of convenience with the British and the rebellious slaves. But after the slaves and French reconciled, the Spanish were defeated by the forces of the black Jacobin general Toussaint Louverture, and in 1795, France gained control of the whole island under the treaties of Basel. French colony 1795 Euro 1809. In 1801, Louverture arrived in Santo Domingo proclaiming the abolition of slavery on behalf of the French Republic. Shortly afterwards, Napoleon dispatched an army which subdued the whole island and ruled it for a few months. Mulattoes and blacks again rose up against these French in October 1802 and finally defeated them in November 1803. On January 1, 1804 the victors declared Saint Domingue to be the independent Republic of Haiti. Even after their defeat by the Haitians, a small French garrison remained in Santo Domingo. Slavery was re-established and many of the A-copyright migra-copyright Spanish colonists returned. In 1805, after crowning himself emperor, Jean-Jacques de Salines invaded, reaching Santo Domingo before retreating in the face of a French naval squadron. In their retreat through the Cibao, the Haitians sacked the towns of Santiago and Mica, slaughtering most of their residents and helping to lay the foundation for two centuries of animosity between the two countries. The French held on to the eastern part of the island, until dealt a serious blow by the Spanish inhabitants of the island at the Battle of Palo Encado on November 7, 1808. With help from the British Navy, the Spanish lay siege to the city of Santo Domingo. The French and the besieged city finally capitulated on July 9, 1809, initiating a 12-year period of Spanish rule, known in Dominican history as the Foolish Spain. Unification of Hispaniola 1821 a Euro 44. The 22-year Haitian occupation that followed is recalled by Dominicans as a period of brutal military rule, though the reality is more complex. It led to large-scale land expropriations and failed efforts to force production of export crops, impose military services restrict the use of the Spanish language, and eliminate traditional customs such as cockfighting. It reinforced Dominicans' perceptions of themselves as different from Haitians in language, race, religion and domestic customs. Yet, this was also a period that definitively ended slavery as an institution in the eastern part of the island. Haiti's constitution forbade whites from owning land and the major landowning families were forcibly deprived of their properties. Most emigrated to the Spanish colonies of Cuba and Puerto Rico, or to independent Gran Colombia, usually with the encouragement of Haitian officials, who acquired their lands. The Haitians, who associated the Catholic Church with the French slave masters who had exploited them before independence, confiscated all church property, deported all foreign clergy, and severed the ties of the remaining clergy to the Vatican. Santo Domingo Euro unregistered trademark S University, the oldest in the Western Hemisphere, lacking students, teachers, and resources, closed down. In order to receive diplomatic recognition from France, Haiti was forced to pay an indemnity of 150 million francs to the former French colonists, which was subsequently lowered to 60 million francs and Haiti imposed heavy taxes on the eastern part of the island. Since Haiti was unable to adequately provision its army, the occupying forces largely survived by commandeering or confiscating food and supplies at gunpoint. Attempts to redistribute land conflicted with the system of communal land tenure, which had arisen with a ranching economy, and newly emancipated slaves resented being forced to grow cash crops under Boyer's Code Rural. In rural areas, the Haitian administration was usually too inefficient to enforce its own laws. It was in the city of Santo Domingo that the effects of the occupation were most acutely felt, and it was there that the movement for independence originated. 
Independence, first period 1844 a Euro 61. In July 16, 1838 Juan Pablo de Ort together with Pedro Alejandro Pina, Juan Isidro Par copyright res, Felipe Alfao, Benito González, Far copyright Lix Mara Ruiz, Juan Nepumacheno Ravello and Jacinto de la Concha founded a secret society called La Trinitaria to win independence from Haiti. A short time later, they were joined by Rama Cube den Marta Asmela, and Francisco del Rosario Zar NCHEZ. In 1843 they allied with the Haitian movement in overthrowing Boyer. Because they had revealed themselves as revolutionaries working for Dominican independence, the new Haitian president, Charles Rivier Rihar copyright Rad, exiled or imprisoned the leading Trinitarios. At the same time, Bernaventura Baez, an Aswa mahogany exporter and deputy in the Haitian National Assembly, was negotiating with the French Consul General for the establishment of a French protectorate. In an uprising time to preempt Baez, on February 27, 1844, the Trinitarios declared independence from Haiti, backed by Pedro Santana, a wealthy cattle rancher from El Sabo who commanded a private army of peons who worked on his estates. Equals First Republic equals, the Dominican Republic's first constitution was adopted on November 6, 1844. The state was commonly known as Santo Domingo in English until the early 20th century. It featured a presidential form of government with many liberal tendencies, but it was marred by Article 210, imposed by Pedro Santana on the Constitutional Assembly by force, giving him the privileges of a dictatorship until the War of Independence was over. These privileges not only served him to win the war, but also allowed him to persecute, execute and drive into exile his political opponents, among which Dort was the most important. During the first decade of independence, Horti mounted five invasions to reconquer the eastern part of the island, in 1844, 1845, 1849, 1853 and 1855 56. Although each was repulsed, Santana used the ever present threat of Haitian invasion as a justification for consolidating dictatorial powers. For the Dominican elite, a Euro mostly landowners. Merchants and priests a Euro the threat of reconquest by more populous Haiti was sufficient to seek annexation by an outside power. Offering the deep water harbor of Samana Bay as bait, over the next two decades, negotiations were made with Britain, France, the United States and Spain to declare a protectorate over the country. Without adequate roads, the regions of the Dominican Republic developed in isolation from one another. In the south, the economy was dominated by cattle ranching and cutting mahogany and other hardwoods for export. This region retained a semi-feudal character with little commercial agriculture, the hacienda as the dominant social unit and the majority of the population living at a subsistence level. In the Saibao Valley, the nation's richest farmland, peasants supplemented their subsistence crops by growing tobacco for export, mainly to Germany. Tobacco required less land than cattle ranching and was mainly grown by smallholders, who relied on itinerant traders to transport their crops to Puerto Plata and Monte Cristi. Santana antagonized the Saibao farmers, enriching himself and his supporters at their expense by resorting to multiple peso printings that allowed him to buy their crops for a fraction of their value. In 1848, he was forced to resign, and was succeeded by his vice president, Manuel Jimenez. After returning to lead Dominican forces against a new Haitian invasion in 1849, Santana marched on Santo Domingo, deposing Jimenez. At his behest, Congress elected Bernaventura Baez as president, but Baez was unwilling to serve as Santana's puppet, challenging his role as the country's acknowledged military leader. In 1853 Santana was elected president for his second term, forcing Baez into exile. Three years later, after repulsing the last Haitian invasion, he negotiated a treaty leasing a portion of Samana Peninsula to a U.S. company. Popular opposition forced him to abdicate, enabling Baez to return and seize power. With the treasury depleted, Baez printed 18 million uninsured pesos, purchasing the 1857 tobacco crop with this currency and exporting it for hard cash at immense profit to himself and his followers. The Sibanian tobacco planters, 
who were ruined when inflation ensued, revolted, recalling Santana from exile to lead their rebellion. After a year of civil war, Santana seized Santo Domingo and installed himself as president. Spanish Colony, Third Period 1861 Euro 65, Pedro Santana inherited a bankrupt government on the brink of collapse. Having failed in his initial bids to secure annexation by the U.S. or France, Santana initiated negotiations with Queen Isabella II of Spain and the Captain General of Cuba to have the island reconverted into a Spanish colony. The American Civil War ended the United States incapable of enforcing the Monroe Doctrine. In Spain, Prime Minister Don Leopoldo O'Donnell advocated renewed colonial expansion, waging a campaign in northern Morocco that conquered the city of Tetuan. In March 1861, Santana officially restored the Dominican Republic to Spain. Equals War of Restoration equals, this move was widely rejected and on August 16, 1863, a national war of restoration began in Santiago, where the rebels established a provisional government. Spanish troops reoccupied the town, but the rebels fled to the mountains along the ill-defined Haitian border. Haitian President Faber Jaffa provided the Dominican rebels with sanctuary and arms, sending a detachment of his presidential guards to fight alongside them. Santana initially was named Capitan General of the new Spanish province, but it soon became obvious that Spanish authorities planned to deprive him of his power, leading him to resign in 1862. Condemned to death by the provisional government, Santana died under mysterious circumstances in 1864, and is widely believed to have committed suicide. Restrictions on trade, discrimination against the mulatto majority, Spain intended to reimpose slavery, and an unpopular campaign by the new Spanish archbishop against extramarital unions, which were widespread after decades of abandonment by the Catholic Church, all fed resentment of Spanish rule. Confined to the major towns, the Spanish army was unable to defeat the guerrillas or contain the insurrection, and suffered heavy losses due to yellow fever. Spanish colonial authorities encouraged Queen Isabella II to abandon the island, seeing the occupation as a nonsensical waste of troops and money. However, the rebels were in a state of political disarray, and proved unable to present a cohesive set of demands. The first president of the provisional government, Papilo Salcedo was deposed by General Gaspar Pilanco in September 1864, who, in turn, was deposed by General Antonio Pimentel three months later. The rebels formalized their provisional rule by holding a national convention in February 1865, which enacted a new constitution, but the new government exerted little authority over the various regional guerrilla cordillos, who were largely independent of one another. Unable to extract concessions from the disorganized rebels, when the American Civil War ended, in March 1865, Queen Isabella annulled the annexation and independence was restored, with the last Spanish troops departing by July. Independence, Second Period 1865 Euro 1916 Equal Second Republic equals, by the time the Spanish departed, most of the main towns lay in ruins and the island was divided among several dozen cordillos. Josa copyright Mara Acabral controlled most of Barahona and the southwest with the support of Bar is his mahogany exporting partners, while cattle rancher Cesar Rio Guillermo assembled a coalition of former Santinista generals in the southeast, and Gregorio Lupera Cube then controlled the north coast. From the Spanish withdrawal to 1879, there were 21 changes of government and at least 50 military uprisings. In the course of these conflicts, two parties emerged. The Partido Rojo represented the southern cattle ranching latifundia and mahogany exporting interests, as well as the artisans and laborers of Santo Domingo, and was dominated by buyers, who continued to seek annexation by a foreign power. The Partido Azul, led by Lupera Cube Den, represented the tobacco farmers and merchants of the Cibao and Puerto Plata and was nationalist and liberal in orientation. During these wars, the small and corrupt national army was far outnumbered by militias organized and maintained by local cordillos who set themselves up as provincial governors. These militias were filled out by poor farmers or landless plantation workers impressed into service who usually took up banditry when not fighting in revolution. 
Within a month of the nationalist victory, Cabral, whose troops were the first to enter Santo Domingo, ousted Pimentel, but a few weeks later General Guillermo led a rebellion in support of Baez, forcing Cabral to resign and allowing Baez to retake the presidency in October. Baez was overthrown by the Cibao farmers under Lupero Cubden, leader of the Partido Azul, the following spring, but Lupero Cubden's allies turned on each other and Cabral reinstalled himself as president in a coup in 1867. After bringing several Azuls into his cabinet the Rojos revolted, returning Baez to power. In 1869, Baez negotiated a treaty of annexation with the United States. Supported by U.S. Secretary of State Williamswood, who hoped to establish a navy base at Samana, in 1871 the treaty was defeated in the United States Senate through the efforts of abolitionist Senator Charles Sumner. In 1874, the Rojo governor of Puerto Plata, Ignacio Maria Gonzalez Santa N, staged a coup in support of an Azul rebellion, but was deposed by the Azuls two years later. In February 1876, Alzaz E. Spalot, backed by Lupero Cubden, was named president, but ten months later troops loyal to Baez returned him to power. One year a new rebellion allowed Gonzalez to seize power, only to be deposed by Cesar Rio Guillermo in September 1878, who was in turn deposed by Lupero Cubden in December 1879. Ruling the country from his hometown of Puerto Plata, enjoying an economic boom due to increased tobacco exports to Germany, Lupero Cubden enacted a new constitution setting a two-year presidential term limit and providing for direct elections, suspended the semi-formal system of bribes and initiated construction on the nation's first railroad, linking the town of La Vega with the port of Tsar Nchez on Samana Bay. The Ten Years' War in Cuba brought Cuban sugar planters to the country in search of new lands and security from the insurrection that freed their slaves and destroyed their property. Most settled in the southeastern coastal plain, and, with assistance from Lupero Cubed Nayuro unregistered trademark S government, built the nation's first mechanized sugar mills. They were later joined by Italians, Germans, Puerto Ricans and Americans in forming the nucleus of the Dominican sugar bourgeoisie, marrying into prominent families to solidify their social position. Disruptions in global production caused by the Ten Years' War the American Civil War and the Franco-Prussian War allowed the Dominican Republic to become a major sugar exporter. Over the following two decades, sugar surpassed tobacco as the leading export, with the former fishing hamlets of San Pedro de Macorís and La Romana transformed into thriving ports. To meet their need for better transportation, over 300 miles of private rail lines were built by and serving the sugar plantations by 1897. An 1884 slump in prices led to a wage freeze, and a subsequent labor shortage was filled by migrant workers from the Leeward Islands Euro the Virgin Islands, St. Kitts and Nevis, Anguilla, and Antigua. These English-speaking blacks were often victims of racism, but many remained in the country, finding work as stevedores and in railroad construction and sugar refineries. Equals Alzis Haro and U.S. Protectorate equals Allying with the emerging sugar interests, the dictatorship of General Alziz Haro, who was popularly known as Leela S., brought unprecedented stability to the island through iron-fisted rule that lasted almost two decades. The son of a Haitian father and a mother from St. Thomas, Leela S. was distinguished by his blackness from most Dominican political leaders, with the exception of Lupero Cubden. He served as president 1882 Euro 1883, 1887, and 1889 Euro 1899, wielding power through a series of puppet presidents when not occupying the office. Incorporating both Rojos and Azuls into his government, he developed an extensive network of spies and informants to crush potential opposition. His government undertook a number of major infrastructure projects, including the electrification of Santo Domingo, the beginning of telephone and telegraph service, the construction of a bridge over the Ozama River, and the completion of a single-track railroad linking Santiago and Puerto Plata, financed by the Amsterdam-based West Dorp Company. Lila S.'s dictatorship was dependent upon heavy borrowing from European and American banks to enrich himself, stabilize the existing debt, strengthen the bribe system, pay for the army, finance infrastructural development and help set up sugar mills. 
however, sugar prices underwent a steep decline in the last two decades of the 19th century. When the West End Dorp Company went bankrupt in 1893, he was forced to mortgage the nation's customs fees, the main source of government revenues, to a New York financial firm called the San Domingo Improvement Company, which took over its railroad contracts and the claims of its European bondholders in exchange for two loans, one of $1.2 million and the other of a £2 million. As the growing public debt made it impossible to maintain his political machine, Haro relied on secret loans from the SDIC, sugar planters and local merchants. In 1897, with his government virtually bankrupt, Leela S. printed five million uninsured pesos, known as paper letters de Leela S., ruining most Dominican merchants and inspiring a conspiracy that ended in his death. In 1899, when Leela S. was assassinated by the Saibao tobacco merchants whom he had been begging for a loan, the national debt was over $35 million, 15 times the annual budget. The six years after Leela S.'s death witnessed four revolutions and five different presidents. The Saibao politicians who had conspired against Hiroa Euro Juan Isidro Jimans, the nation's wealthiest tobacco planter, and General Horatio Vasquez a euro after being named president and vice president, quickly fell out over the division of spoils among their supporters, the I ministers and Ho sisters. Troops loyal to Vasquez overthrew Jimans in 1903, but Vasquez was deposed by I minister General Alejandro Oswai Gil, who seized power for himself. The I ministers toppled his government, but their leader, Carlos Morales, refused to return power to Jimans, aligning with the Ho sisters and he soon faced a new revolt by his betrayed I minister allies. With the nation on the brink of defaulting, France, Germany, Italy and the Netherlands sent warships to Santo Domingo to press the claims of their nationals. In order to preempt military intervention, United States President Theodore Roosevelt introduced the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, declaring that the United States would assume responsibility for ensuring that the nations of Latin America met their financial obligations. In January 1905, under this corollary, the United States assumed administration of the Dominican Republic's customs. Under the terms of this agreement, a receiver general, appointed by the U.S. President, kept 55 percent of total revenues to pay off foreign claimants, while remitting 45 percent to the Dominican government. After two years, the nation's external debt was reduced from $40 million to $17 million. In 1907, this agreement was converted into a treaty, transferring control over customs receivership to the U.S. Bureau of Insular Affairs and providing a loan of $20 million from a New York bank as payment for outstanding claims, making the United States the Dominican Republic's only foreign creditor. In 1906, Morales resigned, and Ho resister Vice President Ramon Carr Series became president. After suppressing a rebellion in the northwest by I Minister General Desiderio Arias, his government brought political stability and renewed economic growth, aided by new American investment in sugar industry. However, his assassination in 1911, for which Morales and Arias were at least indirectly responsible, once again plunged the republic into chaos. For two months, Executive power was held by a civilian junta dominated by the chief of the army, General Alfredo Victoria. The surplus of more than 4 million pesos left by car series was quickly spent to suppress a series of insurrections. He forced Congress to elect his uncle, Eladio Victoria, as president, but the latter was soon replaced by the neutral archbishop Adolfo Nae. After four months, Nae resigned and was succeeded by Hora sister congressman Josa Copyright Bordas Valdez, who aligned with Arias and the I ministers to maintain power. In 1913, Vasquez returned from exile in Puerto Rico to lead a new rebellion. In June 1914 U.S. President Woodrow Wilson issued an ultimatum for the two sides to end hostilities and agree on a new president, or have the United States impose one. After the provisional presidency of Roma Cube Den Bar as Machado, Jimens was elected in October, and soon faced new demands, including the appointment of an American director of public works and financial advisor and the creation of a new military force commanded by U.S. officers. 
the Dominican Congress rejected these demands and began impeachment proceedings against Jimenez. The United States occupied Haiti in July 1915, with the implicit threat that the Dominican Republic might be next. Jimenez's Minister of War Desiderio Arias staged a coup d'état copyright tat in April 1916, providing a pretext for the United States to occupy the Dominican Republic. United States Occupation, 1916-1924 United States Marines landed in Santo Domingo on May 15, 1916. Prior to their landing, Jimenez resigned, refusing to exercise an office regained with foreign bullets. On June 1, Marines occupied Monte Cristi and Puerto Plata, and, after a brief campaign, took Arias's stronghold Santiago by the beginning of July. The Dominican Congress elected Dr. Francisco Henriquez y Carvajal as president, but in November, after he refused to meet the U.S. demands, Wilson announced the imposition of a U.S. military government, with Rear Admiral Harry Shepard Knapp as military governor. The American military government implemented many of the institutional reforms carried out in the United States during the Progressive Era, including reorganization of the tax system, accounting and administration, expansion of primary education, the creation of a nationwide police force to unify the country, and the construction of a national system of roads, including a highway linking Santiago to Santo Domingo. Despite the reforms, Virtually all Dominicans resented the loss of their sovereignty to foreigners, few of whom spoke Spanish or displayed much real concern for the nation's welfare, and the military government, unable to win the backing of any prominent Dominican political leaders, imposed strict censorship laws and imprisoned critics of the occupation. In 1920, U.S. authorities enacted a Land Registration Act which broke up the Terrenos Comuneros and dispossessed thousands of peasants who lacked formal titles to the lands they occupied, while legalizing false titles held by the sugar companies. In the southeast, dispossessed peasants formed armed bands, called Gavaleros, waging a guerrilla war that lasted the duration of the occupation, with most of the fighting in Harta Mare and El Sabo. At any given time, the Marines faced eight to twelve such bands each composed of several hundred followers. The guerrillas benefited from a superior knowledge of the terrain and the support of the local population, and the Marines relied on increasingly brutal counterinsurgency methods. However, rivalries between various Gavilaros often led them to fight against one another, and even cooperate with occupation authorities. In addition, Cultural schisms between the campesinos and city dwellers prevented the guerrillas from cooperating with the urban middle class nationalist movement. In the San Juan Valley, near the border with Horti, followers of a Vodou faith healer named Liborio resisted the occupation and aided the Haitian Cacos in their war against the Americans, until his death in 1922. The principal legacy of the occupation was the creation of a national police force used by the Marines to help fight against the various guerrillas, and later the main vehicle for the rise of Rafael Trujillo. In what was referred to as La Danza de los Melons, with the destruction of European sugar beet farms during World War I, sugar prices rose to their highest level in history, from $5.50 in 1914 to $22.50 per pound in 1920. Dominican sugar exports increased from 122,642 tons in 1916 to 158,803 tons in 1920, earning a record $45.3 million. However, European beet sugar production quickly recovered, which, coupled with the growth of global sugar cane production, glutted the world market, causing prices to plummet to only $2 by the end of 1921. This crisis drove many of the local sugar planters into bankruptcy, allowing large U.S. conglomerates to dominate the sugar industry. By 1926, only 21 major estates remained, occupying an estimated 520,000 acres. Of these, 12 U.S.-owned companies owned more than 81 percent of this total area. While the foreign planters who had built the sugar industry integrated into Dominican society, these corporations expatriated their profits to the United States. As prices declined, sugar estates increasingly relied on Haitian laborers. 
This was facilitated by the military government's introduction of regulated contract labor, the growth of sugar production in the southwest, near the Haitian border, and a series of strikes by coca locaine cutters organized by the Universal Negro Improvement Association. In the 1920 United States presidential election Republican candidate Warren Harding criticized the occupation and promised eventual U.S. withdrawal. While Jimenez and Vasquez sought concessions from the United States, the collapse of sugar prices discredited the military government and gave rise to a new nationalist political organization, the Dominican National Union, led by Dr. Henriquez from exile in Santiago de Cuba, Cuba, which demanded unconditional withdrawal. They formed alliances with frustrated nationalists in Puerto Rico and Cuba, as well as critics of the occupation in the United States itself most notably the nation and the Haiti San Domingo Independent Society. In May 1922, a Dominican lawyer, Francisco P. Nado, went to Washington, D.C. and negotiated what became known as the Haiza Euro P. Nado Plan. It stipulated immediate establishment of a provisional government pending elections, approval of all laws enacted by the U.S. military government, and the continuation of the 1907 treaty until all the Dominican Republic's foreign debts had been settled. On October 1, Juan Bautista Vecini, the son of a wealthy Italian immigrant sugar planter, was named provisional president, and the process of U.S. withdrawal began. The rise and fall of Trujillo 1924 Euro 65 equals Horatio Vasquez 1924 Euro 30 equals the occupation ended in 1924, with a democratically elected government under President Vasquez. The Vasquez administration brought great social and economic prosperity to the country and respected political and civil rights. Rising export commodity prices and government borrowing allowed the funding of public works projects and the expansion and modernization of Santo Domingo. Though considered to be a relatively principled man, Vasquez had risen amid many years of political infighting. In a move directed against his chief opponent Federico Valesquez, in 1927 Vasquez agreed to have his term extended from four to six years. The change was approved by the Dominican Congress, but was of debatable legality. Its enactment effectively invalidated the Constitution of 1924 that Vasquez had previously sworn to uphold. Vasquez also removed the prohibition against presidential re-election, and postulated himself for another term in elections to be held in May 1930. However, his actions had by then led to doubts that the contest could be fair. Furthermore, these elections took place amid economic problems, as the Great Depression had dropped sugar prices to less than $1 per pound. In February, a revolution was proclaimed in Santiago by a lawyer named Rafael Estrella Urea plus or minus A. When the commander of the Guardia Nacional Dominicana, Rafael Leonidas Trujillo Molina, ordered his troops to remain in their barracks, the sick and aging Vasquez was forced into exile and Estrella proclaimed provisional president. In May, Trujillo was elected with 95% of the vote, having used the army to harass and intimidate electoral personnel and potential opponents. After his inauguration in August, at his request, the Dominican Congress proclaimed the beginning of the era of Trujillo. Equals the era of Trujillo 1931 a Euro 61 equals, Trujillo established absolute political control, while promoting economic development a Euro from which mainly he and his supporters benefited a Euro, and severe repression of domestic human rights. Trujillo treated his political party, El Partido Dominicano, as a rubber stamp for his decisions. The true source of his power was the Guardia Nacional a Euro larger, better armed, and more centrally controlled than any military force in the nation's history. By disbanding the regional militias, the Marines eliminated the main source of potential opposition, giving the Guard a virtual monopoly on power. By 1940, Dominican military spending was 21% of the national budget. At the same time, he developed an elaborate system of espionage agencies. By the late 1950s, there were at least seven categories of intelligence agencies, spying on each other as well as the public. All citizens were required to carry identification cards and good conduct passes from the secret police. Obsessed with adulation, 
Trujillo promoted an extravagant cult of personality. When a hurricane struck Santo Domingo in 1930, killing over 3,000 people, he rebuilt the city and renamed it Ciudad Trujillo, Trujillo City. He also renamed the countries and the Caribbean's highest mountain, Pico de Huart, Pico Trujillo. Over 1,800 statues of Trujillo were built, and all public works projects were required to have a plaque with the inscription era of Trujillo, benefactor of the fatherland. As sugar estates turned to Haiti for seasonal migrant labor, increasing numbers settled in the Dominican Republic permanently. The census of 1920, conducted by the U.S. occupation government, gave a total of 28,258 Haitians living in the country. By 1935 there were 52,657. In 1937, Trujillo ordered the massacre of 17,000 to 35,000 Haitians, the alleged justification being Haiti's support for Dominican exiles plotting to overthrow his regime. This event later became known as the Parsley Massacre. The massacre was met with international criticism. The killing was the result of a new policy which Trujillo called the Dominicanization of the frontier. Place names along the border were changed from Creole and French to Spanish, the practice of voodoo was outlawed, quotas were imposed on the percentage of foreign workers that companies could hire, and a law was passed preventing Haitian workers from remaining after the sugar harvest. Although Trujillo sought to emulate Generalissimo Francisco Franco, he welcomed Spanish Republican refugees following the Spanish Civil War. During the Holocaust in the Second World War, the Dominican Republic took in many Jews fleeing Hitler who had been refused entry by other countries. The Jews settled in Sochua. These decisions arose from a policy of Blanquismo, closely connected with anti haitian xenophobia, which sought to add more whites to the Dominican population by promoting immigration from Europe. As part of the Good Neighbor policy, in 1940, the U.S. State Department signed a treaty with Trujillo relinquishing control over the nation's customs. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor Trujillo followed the United States in declaring war on the Axis powers, even though he had openly professed admiration for Hitler and Mussolini. During the Cold War, he maintained close ties to the United States declaring himself the world's number one anti-communist and becoming the first Latin American president to sign a mutual defense assistance agreement with the United States. Trujillo and his family established a near monopoly over the national economy. By the time of his death, he had accumulated a fortune of around $800 million. He and his family own 50 a euro 60 percent of the arable land, some 700,000 acres, and Trujillo owned businesses accounted for 80% of the commercial activity in the capital. He exploited nationalist sentiment to purchase most of the nation's sugar plantations and refineries from U.S. corporations. Operated monopolies on salt, rice, milk, cement, tobacco, coffee, and insurance. Owned two large banks, several hotels, port facilities, an airline and shipping line deducted 10% of all public employees' salaries, and received a portion of prostitution revenues. World War II brought increased demand for Dominican exports, and the 1940s and early 1950s witnessed economic growth and considerable expansion of the national infrastructure. During this period, the capital city was transformed from merely an administrative center to the National Center of Shipping and Industry although it was hardly coincidental that new roads often led to Trujillo's plantations and factories, and new harbors benefited Trujillo's shipping and export enterprises. Mismanagement and corruption resulted in major economic problems. By the end of the 1950s, the economy was deteriorating because of a combination of overspending on a festival to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the regime, overspending to purchase privately owned sugar mills and electricity plants and a decision to make a major investment in state sugar production that proved economically unsuccessful. In 1956, Trujillo's agents in New York murdered Giza S. Mara de Garlandes, a Basque exile who had worked for Trujillo but who later denounced the Trujillo regime and caused public opinion in the United States to turn against Trujillo. In August 1960, 
the Organization of American States imposed diplomatic sanctions against the Dominican Republic as a result of Trujillo's complicity in an attempt to assassinate President Rankin Cube Mulo Betancourt of Venezuela. A group of Dominican dissidents killed Trujillo in a car chase on the way to his country villa near San Cristo Cube Bowl on May 30, 1961. The sanctions remained in force after Trujillo's assassination. His son Ramfis assumed de facto control, but was deposed by his two uncles after a dispute over potential liberalization of the regime. In November 1961, the Trujillo family was forced into exile, fleeing to France, and the heretofore puppet President Joqua N. Balaga assumed effective power. Equals the post Trujillo instability 1961 a Euro 65 equals. At the insistence of the United States, Balaga was forced to share power with a seven member Council of State, established on January 1, 1962, and including moderate members of the opposition. OAS sanctions were lifted January 4, and, after an attempted coup, Balaga resigned and went into exile on January 16. The reorganized Council of State, under President Rafael Filiberto Bonilli, headed the Dominican government until elections could be held. These elections, in December 1962, were won by Juan Bosch, a scholar and poet who had founded the opposition Partido Revolucionario Dominicano in exile, during the Trujillo years. His leftist policies, including land redistribution, nationalization of certain foreign holdings, and attempts to bring the military under civilian control, antagonized the military officer corps, the Catholic hierarchy, and the upper class, who feared another Cuba. In September 1963 Bosch was overthrown by a right-wing military coup led by Colonel Ela as Wesson and was replaced by a three-man military junta. Bosch went into exile to Puerto Rico. Afterwards a supposedly civilian triumvirate established a de facto dictatorship. United States Intervention 1965 Euro 66 On April 16, 1965 Growing dissatisfaction generated another military rebellion on April 24, 1965 that demanded Bosch's restoration. The insurgents, reformist officers and civilian combatants loyal to Bosch commanded by Colonel Francisco Caumaya plus or minus O, and who called themselves the Constitutionalists, staged a coup, seizing the National Palace. Immediately, conservative military forces, led by Wesson and calling themselves loyalists, struck back with tank assaults and aerial bombings against Santo Domingo. On April 28, these anti-Bosch army elements requested U.S. military intervention and U.S. forces landed, ostensibly to protect U.S. citizens and to evacuate U.S. and other foreign nationals. U.S. President Lyndon B. Johnson, convinced of the defeat of the Loyalist forces and fearing the creation of a second Cuba on America's doorstep, ordered U.S. forces to restore order. In what was initially known as Operation Power Pack, 23,000 U.S. troops were ultimately ordered to the Dominican Republic. Denied a military victory, the constitutionalist rebels quickly had a constitutionalist Congress elect Kaumaya plus or minus O president of the country. U.S. officials countered by backing General Imbert. On May 7, Imbert was sworn in as president of the Government of National Reconstruction. The next step in the stabilization process, as envisioned by Washington and the OAS, was to arrange an agreement between President Kaumaya plus or minus O and President Imbert to form a provisional government committed to early elections. However, Kaumaya plus or minus O refused to meet with Imbert until several of the loyalist officers, including Wesson Y. Wesson, were made to leave the country. On May 13, General Imbert began Operation Limpser and his forces were successful in eliminating pockets of rebel resistance outside Ciudad Nueva and in silencing Radio Santo Domingo. Operation Limpser ended on May 21. By May 14 the Americans had established a safety corridor connecting the San Isidro Air Base and the Derwent Bridge to the Imbajada Hotel and United States Embassy in the center of Santo Domingo essentially sealing off the constitutionalist area of Santo Domingo. Roadblocks were established and patrols ran continuously. Some 6,500 people from many nations were evacuated to safety. In addition, the U.S. forces airlifted in relief supplies for Dominican nationals. By mid-May, 
a majority of the OAS voted for Operation Push Ahead, the reduction of United States forces and their replacement by an Inter-American Peace Force. The Inter-American Peace Force was formally established on May 23. The following troops were sent by each country, Brazil, 1,130, Honduras, 250, Paraguay, 184, Nicaragua, 160, Costa Rica, 21 military police, and El Salvador, three staff officers. The first contingent to arrive was a rifle company from Honduras which was soon backed by detachments from Costa Rica, El Salvador, and Nicaragua. Brazil provided the largest unit, a reinforced infantry battalion. Brazilian General Hugo Alvim assumed command of the OAS ground forces, and on May 26 the U.S. forces began to withdraw. The fighting continued until August 31, 1965 when a truce was declared. Most American troops left shortly afterwards as policing and peacekeeping operations were turned over to Brazilian troops, but some U.S. military presence remained until September 1966. A total of 44 American soldiers died, 27 in action. 172 were wounded in action, as were six Brazilians and five Paraguayans. An estimated 6,000 to 10,000 Dominicans died, mostly civilians. Facing ongoing threats and attacks, including a particularly violent attack at the Hotel Matum in Santiago de los Caballeros, Kamala Plus or Minus O accepted an agreement imposed by U.S. government. The Dominican provisional president, Garclay Godoy, sent Colonel Kamala Plus or Minus O as the military attaché copyright to the Dominican Embassy to the U.K. The Balaga era 1966 a Euro 96. Equals Balaga's second presidency 1966 a Euro 78 equals, in June 1966, Joker N. Balaga, leader of the Reformist Party, was elected and then re-elected to office in May 1970 and May 1974, both times after the major opposition parties withdrew late in the campaign because of a high degree of violence by pro-government groups. On November 28, 1966 a constitution was created, signed, and put into effect. The constitution stated that the president was elected to a four-year term. If there was a close election there would be a second round of voting to decide the winner. The voting age was 18, but married people under 18 could also vote. Balaga led the Dominican Republic through a thorough economic restructuring based on opening the country to foreign investment while protecting state-owned industries and certain private interests. This distorted, dependent development model produced uneven results. For most of Balaga's first nine years in office the country experienced high growth rates, to the extent that people talked about the Dominican miracle. Foreign, mostly U.S. investment, as well as foreign aid, flowed into the country. Sugar, then the country's main export product enjoyed good prices in the international market, and tourism grew tremendously. However, this excellent macroeconomic performance was not accompanied by an equitable distribution of wealth. While a group of new millionaires flourished during Balaga's administrations, the poor simply became poorer. Moreover, the poor were commonly the target of state repression, and their socio-economic claims were labeled communist and dealt with accordingly by the state security apparatus. In the May 1978 election, Balaga was defeated in his bid for a fourth successive term by Antonio Guzma N. Fernandez of the PRD. Balaga then ordered troops to storm the election center and destroy ballot boxes, declaring himself the victor. U.S. President Jimmy Carter refused to recognize Balaga's claim, and, faced with the loss of foreign aid, Balaga stepped down. Equals Guzma N slash Blanco Interregnum 1978 Euro 86 equals, Guzma N's inauguration on August 16 marked the country's first peaceful transfer of power from one freely elected president to another. By the late 1970s, economic expansion slowed considerably as sugar prices declined and oil prices rose. Rising inflation and unemployment diminished support for the government and helped trigger a wave of mass emigration from the Dominican Republic to New York, coming on the heels of the similar migration of Puerto Ricans in the preceding decades. Elections were again held in 1982. 
Salvador Jorge Blanco of the Dominican Revolutionary Party defeated Bosch and a resurgent Balaga. Equals Balaga's third presidency 1986 a Euro 96 equals, Balaga completed his return to power in 1986 when he won the presidency again and remained in office for the next ten years. Elections in 1990 were marked by violence and suspected electoral fraud. The 1994 election too saw widespread pre-election violence, often aimed at intimidating members of the opposition. Balaga won in 1994 but most observers felt the election had been stolen. Under pressure from the United States, Balaga agreed to hold new elections in 1996. He himself would not run. Rise of democracy 1996 A Euro present, since 1998 Freedom House has categorized the Dominican Republic as a free country. Equals Fernandez, first administration 1996 A Euro 2000 equals, in 1996, U.S. raised Lenel Fernandez Reina of Bosch's Partido de la Liberacia Cube den Dominicana secured more than 51% of the vote, through an alliance with Balaga. The first item on the president's agenda was the partial sale of some state-owned enterprises. Fernandez was praised for ending decades of isolationism and improving ties with other Caribbean countries but he was criticized for not fighting corruption or alleviating the poverty that affected 60% of the population. Equals Major Ye's administration 2000 a Euro 04 equals, in May 2000 the center-left hyper-cubed leader Major Ye of the PRD was elected president amid popular discontent over power outages in the recently privatized electric industry. His presidency saw major inflation and instability of the peso in 2003 because of the bankruptcy of three major commercial banks in the country due to the bad policies of the principal managers. During his remaining time as president he took action to save most savers of the closed banks, avoiding a major crisis. The relatively stable currency fell from about 16 Dominican pesos to 1 United States dollar to about 60 Dominican pesos to 1 US dollar and was in the 40s to the dollar when he left office in August 2004. In the May 2004 presidential elections he was defeated by former President Lenel Fernandez. Equals Fernandez, second administration 2004 a Euro 12 equals, Fernandez instituted austerity measures to deflate the peso and rescue the country from its economic crisis, and in the first half of 2006, the economy grew 11.7%. The peso is currently at the exchange rate of 39 Dominican pesos to 1 US dollar. Over the last three decades, remittances from Dominicans living abroad, mainly in the United States, have become increasingly important to the economy. From 1990 to 2000, the Dominican population of the US doubled in size, from 520,121 in 1990 to 1,041,910 two-thirds of whom were born in the Dominican Republic itself. More than half of all Dominican Americans live in New York City, with the largest concentration in the neighborhood of Washington Heights in northern Manhattan. Over the past decade, the Dominican Republic has become the largest source of immigration to New York City, and today the metropolitan area of New York has a larger Dominican population than any city except Santo Domingo. Dominican communities have also developed in New Jersey, Miami, Boston, Philadelphia, Providence, Rhode Island, and Lawrence, Massachusetts. In addition, tens of thousands of Dominicans and their descendants live in Puerto Rico. Many Dominicans arrive in Puerto Rico illegally by sea across the Mona Passage, some staying and some moving on to the mainland U.S. Dominicans living abroad sent an estimated $3 billion in remittances to relatives at home, in 2006. In 1997, a new law took effect, allowing Dominicans living abroad to retain their citizenship and vote in presidential elections. President Fernandez, who grew up in New York, was the principal beneficiary of this law. The Dominican Republic was involved in the U.S.-led coalition in Iraq, as part of the Spain-led Latin American Plus Ultra Brigade. But in 2004, the nation pulled its 300 or so troops out of Iraq equals Dana Lo Medina, 2012 a Euro 2015 equals, Medina began his tenure with a series of controversial tax reforms so as to deal with the government's troublesome fiscal situation encountered by the new administration. See also, History of the Americas, 
History of the Caribbean, History of Haiti, History of Latin America, History of North America, List of Presidents of the Dominican Republic, Politics of the Dominican Republic, Spanish Colonization of the Americas, Timeline of Santo Domingo. References External links Map of the Dominican Republic is a map from 1910.